the box seat, brought to you by our stable of sponsors. Hi everyone, welcome to this edition of Your Box Seat. Yes, it's brought to you by our stable of sponsors, Michael Guerin, off the back of the Night of Champions. Just about couldn't have gone better off the back of some inclement weather in the afternoon. It ended up being a splendid night at Cambridge Raceway and the racing was outstanding. Yeah, hi Greg. Big hi to everybody watching around Australasia. I know plenty of our Australian viewers will be watching so they can skite about the trot, so you should because uh, it was a wonderful performance from the winner. It's called the Night of Champions. I think he was the only champion equine we saw, but the pacing race won by one of the champions of all time and the great Barry Purden. I loved the night, Greg. It was fantastic. The atmosphere was great. The drama was very enthralling. And there were two victories by a very similar nature. They weren't big margins, Gregory, but they were very very big statements. Yep, absolutely they were. So what can you look forward to on your box seat? Uh, we will review uh, the third running of the race by Grins, won by Merlin. Zachary Butcher was certainly grinning at the end of that. The Trans-Tasman Triumph for Just Believe, deservedly called a champion now. Uh, we'll wrap up some of the undercard as well. Preview Diamonds Day, huge day down south in Vicargill on Sunday. The great trotter Majestic Man was retired this week and we have a first time driving winner from a couple of weeks ago. But let's get straight into it. The third running of the million dollar race by grins. This was the all important start. Don't stop dreaming. Powered up here. I was lucky enough to be in the mobile, Michael, and Kango came out as quickly as he could. Don't stop dreaming was too fast. And the initial thoughts of Zachary Butcher was he wanted to lead. Well, that changed pretty quickly. It sure did. Uh, I think probably the most surprising part was just how easily Don't Stop Dreaming led because he hasn't been a gate speed blazer, but they went 2.35. They were going record time. Here, he looked home, and that changed very, very quickly. Here's Aaron White after a, a great, great night of calling from him. Don't Stop Dreaming really digs in, but the magic of Merlin, he's got the race by Grins. Merlin beats Don't Stop Dreaming, photo third. We've got Old Town Road and Kango between those. Better Eclipse, a big run, and back on the inside, self-assured. Zachary, congratulations. I know how special this will be for so many reasons, and we'll talk about some of those, but what about this horse? We used to call him a little horse. He's a tank. He's a beast. Um, what a thriller. I might be too early to say it, but that'd probably near on be my biggest thrill in racing so far. That's a big statement. You've won a lot of very good races. I watched you in the warm-up and saw how focused you were as you get to shake the hand of the great man himself. <laughs> but you were totally focused. In that warm-up, you had one thing on your mind, and that was winning that race. Yeah, it's a, it's a big occasion. Um, I said to the Carlo that was coming with me, um, starting to get the shakes, need to get out on that track and settle these nerves. And um, it's a big stage. I've always sort of said this race, it's such a spectacle. And yeah, the nerves do run high, but I, I guess if you're not nervous, you're not ready. And, um, you know, we had, we, we had intentions of trying to lead and um, obviously Nat was just too quick off for us and had to adapt, change plan. and. Um, Look, it worked out. I've got to give all credit to Barry Scott and the team. Uh, they sort of haven't been coming from wide tonight, and when I pulled him out at about the 300 there, he was just trucking. Uh, he, he, he felt like a different beast, and uh, he just keeps getting better and better. This battle with Don't Stop Dreaming continues. When he was in front, were you concerned at any stage, or was he just travelling that well? Uh, you've always got to be concerned, you know. You, you never know what's under the hood of uh, every other horse in that race, even ones behind us, but 
you know, tonight you had to be handy. Um, it's, it's hard making back uh, ground from back, and I think they said 2.35 and a bit, and um, quick quarters, uh, yeah, yeah. You always respect your opposition, 100%. But uh, you've got to believe in your own horse. And like I said pre-race, um, I believed in uh, Barry and Scotty and what the team had done. And, and they told me they were 100% happy and it showed tonight. Between them and owner Dean Shannon, he's a pretty good judge of a horse. He's a pretty good judge of a person. And you've become good friends. And I know what it means to you to win races like this for him. I hope Dean's watching. Dean, you're a bloody champion, mate. I love you. Uh, it was a, such a thrill to get this win for you. We've had so many uh, big wins, but this is, uh, this is the best of the best. This is uh, top class and the big fella. The, the old wee fella, the big fella, he's, uh, he's shown his worth and he's got a heart. I mean, uh, just so exciting to drive. And uh, honestly, I can't thank everyone enough. I get put in the seat and uh, I get the easy job. I point them in the right direction and it's all the hard work that goes in before. So, again, huge thanks to Barry, Scotty, the team. Um, and obviously, Dean, hope you're home, mate. I love it. All right. You've done it on your home track, mate. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you very much, Greg. Beauty, Huge thrill there for Zachary Butcher, and he ran second in it last year, Michael, as we know, with Old Town Road behind Copy That. This time, he gets the win on his home track. Pretty special stuff. Yeah, lots to unpack. So we'll get to the winner first. Barry Purden's first million-dollar winner after an extraordinary career as a trainer. That's a lovely exclamation mark, Greg, with more to come. Uh, Scott Phelan, I think, we've seen through so many interviews on this show and things that a lot of people get home don't get to see is how Scott's matured into his role. I thought five years ago he was very much a junior partner. That is absolutely not the case now. This is every bit as much his win as Barry's. Um, then you get to Zach. Of course, he grew up near that track. That is his home track, as you mentioned in the interview. It was a beautiful drive. I'm not sure it worked out exactly how he wanted, but when you go forward, you give yourself more options than if you go back. And he got the timing right. I think the vision from above probably showed that Don't Stop Dreaming got away in him far more than it looked to be on the normal coverage. And when you see he had a good two lengths to make up, he had to get that right because he could have panicked down the back when some moved up, Greg. And I believe if he had pulled out, then he wouldn't have won. But Zachary's patience, which I think comes from his dad as a driver, um, was inch perfect there because the margin wasn't that big. And then, of course, Dean Shannon, who has been buying horses for a long time, Greg, and probably more horses than he should have bought. And now he's got the right recipe. He's buying with Barry and Scotty predominantly and they're putting a very good driver on, and it just works. Whereas, like a lot of people, Dean used to buy horses that weren't that good and hope for miracles, and they don't happen very often. I spoke to him on Saturday. He couldn't be there. Um, He had work obligations. Five minutes after the race, Greg, he was on a call with the big bosses of Entain, who basically run New Zealand racing from afar uh, in England. So it goes to show to get to that level and to have that sort of money to spend, um, you need to work pretty bloody hard. Yeah. So that, that's the Merlin story. It's a funny thing, I, I've always liked Merlin as a horse, but I somewhat doubted he might become this horse because if he was by better's delight, I would have thought he will because they get better. But often the art majors have been comets that have flown across the harness racing sky, burning brightly, then burnt out. I think he's very different. I watched him from my upstairs position while I was doing the radio, warm up two races before Gregory, and... I saw both him and Don't Stop Dreaming warm up. And when you see them stripped down from their gear with the hopples off and not a lot of intent in their warms ups, he's become a physically superior horse to Don't Stop Dreaming. Now, that doesn't mean he's always going to beat him because Don't Stop Dreaming did lead and go 235 there. But he's definitely stronger. What that means for him heading forward, I don't know. But it's better than being a two and three year old squib type of horse. So when I spoke to Barry at length on Saturday morning, uh, he said, yes, Taylor Mile, that's Friday week, week after the messenger, he is keen to miss the Auckland Cup. Now, that's important. It's also second favourite for the Auckland Cup. He is keen to miss the Auckland Cup, and he wants to go to Queensland, where, Greg, you'll be. Uh, he'll win the Rising Sun, maybe. Frankie Ferocious will be there, so it might be a pushover. And then he would have to take on Leap to Fame uh, in a couple of the big open class races, including the Blacks of Fake, and that'll give us a very good indication of where he stands. So that's the plan for him. 
Um, don't stop dreaming, speaking to Mark Purden. He is definitely going to the Taylor Mile and the Messenger, and he is going to go to the Auckland Cup. Obviously, he's won from the standing start in the Franklin Cup, so he's heading to the Auckland Cup. So he now should be a very hot favourite for that. Um, Speak the Truth is sticking around. He'll go to the two races at Alexandra Park. Mark wasn't unhappy, he was self-assured, he got no luck. He will go to those races. Old Town Road, who I thought was very good, Greg will I also presume go there. And great to see can go getting money on his home track and his biggest ever career placing. And I would suggest he goes there. So Greg, we have a really good bunch of races still coming up. Better Eclipse is going to go to two of those. Then Greg Sugars is going to make a decision around an Auckland Cup, and that'll tie into Just Believe, which we'll talk about shortly. So hopefully, Greg, I think that's covered most of the bases. Yeah, it has, uh, and market-wise, 250 a pair, Don't Stop Dreaming and Merlin for The Messenger. No market out for the Taylor Mile, and Don't Stop Dreaming is $1.75. Merlin's still in the Auckland market, but it's got doubtful around it, and Better Eclipse is the second favourite uh, in that $7. Old Town Road, $9 along with Self Assured. Of course, this week, Michael, is the Nullarbor, so a um, little bit of ki- Kiwi interest there from expats, the likes of minstrel but it doesn't seem to have the same momentum as what we've just seen in the race by grins. I think the trans-Tasman thing, the lack of a trans-Tasman thing affects it but look, if you live in WA it's a bigger race yep. and I've got you know it's wonderful you have both I don't think one needs to be better than the other what I tend to find with races Greg is that when people go to races they think they're the greatest thing on earth I went to the championships two weeks ago greatest I've ever had in my life all that rubbish <laughs> and then you come back and if you're not there you don't care No. and I know people who were at the, ch- the race by grins on Friday thought it was amazing they weren't there last year and it was crap Yeah. So I think a lot of people have an emotional attachment to races they go to the bottom line is the Nullarbor won't be as strong as this race then again let's, the Blacks are fake might be stronger than both of them Yeah. they might have Swayze who's the New Zealand Cup winner, and Leap to Fame, and Merlin. So I think it'll be wonderful. I think it's great that WA have it. I think it's going to be part of a wonderful weekend with the Quokka. Good on them. I hope they have a barn burner of a night at Gloucester Park. I don't really care which race is better because I think that in that case, Greg, the the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Yep, exactly. And congratulations to the slot holder, SENZ, who won their second race by Grins. Of course, they won the inaugural uh, with Self Assured. The inaugural running of the Tab Trot. Let's go uh, to Just Believe, this remarkable horse who's a globetrotter, of course, Michael, the winner of... uh, 11 of his last 13 starts. All importantly, the start, Ben Hope came out of the gate with Muscle Mountain, but the lead was never going to be there. It wasn't, but you know what? I applaud Ben for doing that. He, he had a crack, and he did something which people weren't expecting. We'll get back to him later, because I've spoken to him. Call Me Breeze leads for home, but Greg, this is a no-argument performance. He sat parked, just believe, and he beat a very good horse sitting park, better than the horses he usually beats. Here's the TRB trot for now. A true great of the trotting world in Australasia. And just believe he'll get the TAB trot over Call Me The Breeze and Queen Elida. This trans-Tasman rivalry is back and Harry is top of the tree. How good's that, eh? Uh, just amazing, you know, like we've said it all before of how, how special this horse is and uh, yeah, to come here and, um, and, and prove that on uh, in, in this country is is, uh, is no easy feat. And, uh, yeah, he stood tall. Take us through the race because there was a vice-like speed in and around you. You were patient for the first section. And it was a slow first quarter, 31-plus. Then you whipped around. Just take us through the first section of the race and how you were feeling. Yeah, um, kind of how I sort of read the race with the speed early. Um, I thought Call Me The Breeze would lead if they wanted to. So that uh, that all sort of went to plan for us and we were able to love a, a good spot. And the fact that there wasn't a great at early pace that didn't hesitate to get around when we could. So, I, you know, I wasn't confident I could beat Call Me The Breeze under that uh, scenario because he did get it cheap early. Um, but I knew I'd be in there for the fight. Harry put Australia on the map worldwide. We've run one, two, three here in New Zealand, which was the toughest place to win these sort of trotting races. How does that feel as an Aussie? Oh, it's amazing. I mean, it's, uh, you know, going back a few years now when we saw Karen Manning bring Arden Rooney over here, and I just thought, wow, how special that was, because it just doesn't happen very often that uh, Aussies' paces or, or, um, or trotters especially
possibly could get over here and win. It just seems like such a daunting task. So for, for Jess and I to um, have a horse capable of coming over here and, and taking out a good race, it's just phenomenal. And as you say, one, two, three, the Aussies, we've come so far. Let's send a message to Jess. I know she'll be watching on uh, Trot's Vision back home and a lot of Aussies will be watching. I know you all put in a, a lot of hard work as a team. A message to her back home. Well done, babe. We did it. Yeah, huge result uh, for Lara Jane Farms and a big thank you to Greg Sugars for his availability for all of the media. Michael, no argument. You said it yourself. He was just simply too good and he deserves that champion status now. He does because that's the first time he's sat parked outside a just, oh sorry, by Call Me The Breeze and beaten him with other good horses around him and the two New Zealanders who didn't really get into the race so they weren't factors, but he's done it away from home. Yes, I know he went to Sweden, but he didn't win anything there. So you don't become a champion not winning. So he's an Australasian champion. And the good news is we get to see more of him next week in the Lyle Creek, that's Friday week, then the week after in the National Trot. And here's where things get juicy. I spoke to Greg on radio yesterday and he's toying with the idea, along with the connections, of staying here for the Road Cup. Now, Greg can't stay here that long, but the beauty of it is one of his close friends in harness racing is Josh Dickey. Josh Dickey works at Stonewall Stud where the horse is staying. So it's a really easy thing for Greg to say, hey, mate, look after this for two weeks. Um, Josh obviously is an outstanding trainer of a trotter, and then they can come back and compete in the Road Cup. I think they will. I think he'll do that if he holds his form, because Greg, it's $200,000, and not many trotting races in Australasia are. So I think we've got him here for the autumn. The good part about that is, is that for Muscle Mountain and Oscar Bonavina, they both at least get a crack, Greg. We'll get back to the other Aussies in a second. Spoke to Ben Hope about Muscle Mountain. He needed to have a crack at the start, he thinks, because if he'd gone back to last, what would have happened happened, which is you run on and you're just not a factor. He said he was a little bit okay, look, it just wasn't his best work. But I don't think his best work is when he comes from back in the field and he got pushed back there. So no problems with his drive. Mark Purden said Oscar Bonavita pulled too hard, not a position he's used to being back uh, in, back on the marker pegs. He will go through these races, same races. Muscle Mountain will more than likely, according to Ben, miss the Lyle Creek, go the um, National Trot, then the Row Cup. So that brings them and Just Believe into the same space together again, which will be great for the trotting races heading forward. Call Me The Breeze is going home to have a break and then probably the Queensland Carnival where he'll stand out like a sore thumb, a very fast sore thumb. Queen Elida is going home to race at Menangle on May the 4th and the Mears race. She may well come back to the Road Cup, but then again, if Just Believe's coming, she might not. Uh, and RC Phoenix has had a very long campaign, Greg. He's heading to the Spelling Paddock. Um, just on the Hope Horses, they are looking to start Euro Cash and Midnight Dash in those races too. So there'll be enough depth for Alexandra Park to get all of those races off the ground and just believe Greg will give us something to follow to see if he is beatable or whether he becomes an embellished Trans-Tasman champion. Just on Just Believe and Greg and Jess, Better Eclipse isn't qualified from a standing start. But if Just Believe stays, that may increase the chances that Better Eclipse stays, because we probably need him in an Auckland Cup. It's not looking like a huge field, and he would add to that. But he would need to qualify from a stand at some stage, which only basically means going to a trial. He doesn't need to do much else, Greg. Uh, and speak the truth, we'll stick around for the two pacing races, but not head uh, to the Cup. So that's where they're all going. And then Gregory, I suppose, if he does go unbeaten through the autumn here, you start to say, well, where does Just Believe sit in the Australasian great trotters? Because there's been some bloody good ones. Yeah, absolutely. And I think now he's knocking on the door of the top 10. Mm. And if he wins a row cup and a third into Dominion, then he starts to knock on the door of the top five. And if people think that's a little bit harsh, don't forget the top five includes horses like Lyle Creek and Scotch Notch and, of course, the great Maori's Idol. So it's a pretty tough five to break into. But Greg, for a little horse, 
he's making an awful lot of noise at the front door of it. Yep, and he still had the earplugs in, and he had to sit outside a very good horse and call me the breeze. Uh, Nathan Jack copped a fine for whip use, 650, and I think he got about six days, and Chris Venosio uh, got about four days as well in a small fine. So that was out of that. Dollar twenty five, just believe, uh, to win the national trot. And, yeah, that Row Cup market is still a little bit up in the air as to uh, whether he does go there. Michael, I need to ask you this around the slot races. So three years now, the race by Grins. Uh, obviously, the tab trot was only in one year. There's a lot of work to be done to retain them. But I think there's two parts to this. If you take a slot at 75000 and they race for a million dollars, you need to get more than half your money back as a minimum. So therefore, there has to be a couple of people come into play there. Entain slash TAB and Harness Race in New Zealand because at the moment their contribution they don't make one um, so that has to that has to enhance that for mine uh, the trot slot I think is about right it's fifty thousand maybe it could go up a little bit again from a contribution from the governing body but I think that I think that should really happen I don't think there'll be any doubt about that I, I don't think our viewers are going to understand that Greg so you're telling me that Harness Racing New Zealand doesn't contribute to the stakes for these two races? Nope. N nope. Not anything can, at all? Nope. I can guarantee you that that, certainly in the first two years, whether they have this year, I, I, I don't have that information, but no, they don't. And yet, they receive all of the money from the turnover. Now, they won't like me saying that, I, but that's I actually they, true. I thought they topped up the 25000 to go from five seventy five to 600 But even No, then, that, came, that came from uh, North Island. That came uh, from a North Island club. Well, but, even that, yeah. it's a minuscule amount of money. I, I, I agree. I, I, I think it's important to strike what Well, you can't rely hold. exactly or, or entirely on the slot holders to fund these races. because no, no, particularly Particularly when if they need to win one of them or at least place in second and two of them to break even, it's hardly an incentive. Well, I, I think they need to strike while the iron's hot. So go to people who have feel good and have had good experiences, so the first slot holders, and say, would you like to do this again? And yes, say we're hoping to get more money. Yes, more money is imperative, at least a $200,000 top up on each race. So you're competing for 200,000 of other people's money as well as your own. Explain to people how the tax advantages work for those who do. Um, I, I think Cambridge should get all that information out there now and everybody should get together on it. Because if you don't, Greg, the option is somebody else, like Victoria, who had the first four homes, say, well, we'll have our own slot trot. And while that would be not ideal for Australasian harness racing, then what's to stop them? Not that I think harness racing Victoria has a lot of money to throw around at the moment. So get it out there now, in the next two weeks, because very quickly, Gregory, what is going to happen now is we're going to get into a situation where the NZB Kiwi, the big galloping slot race, starts to take all the noise. And you want to get in before the noise so the corporates and other people feel comfortable. You may think those are two different audiences, but a lot of the hype is in the, the immediate emotion. So I think we should get David and his team, I spoke to David about this, get that information out in the next two weeks. And if somebody wants to drop out, great, get new people to come in. Because the threat with the trot races, Greg, half of those slots are bought by people who wanted to put their own horses into them. And of course, that's not sustainable. In saying that, those who drop out could be replaced by people who have similar class of horses. So um, the quicker we act on this, the more we get that night stored away. Greg, I love the female race, the all-female race, the Brilliant Dorothy Cuts. It. Yep. I love the fact there was a size stake seat. I want to push a couple more. Have a couple more. Have a three-year-old size stake seat. I don't know what else is floating around. Mm. Have a three-year-old trot. Bigger, better. I'll never forget what something, what something Chris Wallace said to me about three months ago. He said, you don't get the public's attention very often when you do make it. Count. You need to grab it. Yep, absolutely you do. I uh, probably should clarify that too. I'm pretty sure Entain TAB put some money into the trot slot, uh, but uh, certainly yep. the other yeah, race. Uh, Entain, yep. uh, Entain definitely with, put with, money into with the, the tab slot. trot. Well, they sponsored it for a start. 100%. For a start, that, start they did. So, yeah, and I think, I think but but like I'm, I'm sure the other race was completely... Um, yeah, yeah, I, I think it was 100k the egg, Greg. So I was talking about more about Harness Race in yep. New Zealand. I no, haven't broken yep. it down. Yep, but Leo, totally. let, let's get it out there. Let's get, yep. get it on the show. Let's get it, get it on the radio. And yep. let's get people bidding now for these slots again. Yep. And there's no reason you can't do what NZTR did.
and no. has people bid for these? Things? No, absolutely not. You mentioned the size stakes heat. Let's go and have a look at Hadron Collider. Uh, this was Tony Hurley. Third winning drive. Sonny won three races this horse. He won at Addington with it. Now he's won twice up north. And this was a brilliant display of horsemanship. 153, uh, trained by Robert and Jenna Dunn. Too good uh, for Vesem. Cole Chisel was uh, charging home. Uh, we Walk by Faith didn't get the run that he needed. He wanted to get the front and he couldn't get there. Uh, Sire Stakes Market. Uh, it's at Addington. The final Cole Chisel, $3.50. $4. Chase a Dream. Dreams are free. Goes round. Uh, and the supremacy this week, $4. We walk by faith, $5. Built for glory goes around. And the supremacy this week, $11. He might be quite good, this horse, though, especially the way he rolled around Cambridge, Michael. I think he's always been fast. I think he's had a few little issues and teething things and learning how to control his speed. Controlled it pretty well there. And, yeah, we, we all know what Cambridge short track mile racing or 1700s with small fields can be. They can be incredibly tactical. You end up one spot further back than you should be and you can't win, and that was a prime example of it. But he still went 53. If he can go 53 there, Greg, he's got a 52 and maybe a 51 somebody out somewhere else. So he's a horse with a big future. I'm still not convinced about our three-year-old crop. I know it's very early in the year, and they might develop into a very good three-year-old crop later in the year, but too many of the horses in this crop keep getting beaten for me, Greg. Yep, they do. Uh, 1.8 million, 40% increase. Uh, GBR was about 25%, so a great night at uh, Cambridge. Jolly Mont, of course, took out uh, the Country Cups uh, race there too, and it was a brilliant performance from him. Short break for us. On the other side, we'll reflect on the career of one RJ Dunn. Break it down by shapes and sizes. Robert, a rear milestone, joining a very elite club. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks for that, Greg. It's uh, 47 years in the making. But I've had a lot of help, as you know, over the years and, and a fantastic crew around me all the way through. With the appropriately named Got the Chocolates, with Johnny doing the driving for owners that have been with you for a long time, Ross and Angela Gordon, it was almost the perfect storm, wasn't it? Yeah, it was really. There would have been three lots of owners. There would have been, of course, the Newmans from Ashburton and the Sparkses from Ashburton who have been with me the whole way through from, since I started in 78, uh, 77, 78. And then, of course, Roscoe and Ange just after the uh, 2000, 2001. And uh, fantastic. It was a great result. You've had some awesome horses over the years. One stands out as the master. We'll get to him in a moment. But as far as great horses go, probably Defoe, or really good horses, Defoe was one that springs to mind. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like I kicked off with obviously leaving gyms with Bolton Bird. And I thought, boy, if I get a horse to train as good as him, it'd be great. And... Within the first year, I had a horse that you mentioned, Lyndon Robert. He was a top two-year-old of the year, and shortly after that came Alabama Wiz, who was top two-year-old trial of the year, and then Defoe and, and Master came along, but Defoe was a super little horse. Had he gone away from standing starts, he would have been better again, but just just couldn't get that right, even with the great DD9 driving. And if nobody get him away, I thought, you know, Dennis actually loved the little fella and did a great job driving a lot of the time. Um, but yeah, and it just it just carried on from there. Yeah. Master got things going though, an incredible racehorse. I think he started in about five or six cups, and I know he didn't win one, which irked you for a long time, but uh, what, what a magnificent racehorse he was. He was, he's got the co-record actually, seven, seven New Zealand cups with, with another horse, I can't remember his name, um, back in the day, and that's probably a record never be broken. He was a phenomenal horse. And uh, in fact, not many people know this, but he had more starts in Australia than he did in New Zealand, just by about two, I think. Yeah. Mm. Terrific racehorse. Um, I know you said Sunday Sun wouldn't supersede what he achieved, but he got really close, and those Dominion runs, in particular the last one, was quite remarkable. Yeah, that was that was a real thrill because you know, for all, uh, all the way down the straight, you thought Muscle Mountain had him, and even I even thought because I was just down in the, the other side of the winning post, and I still thought Muscle Mountain had actually won it. Couldn't believe it when. You know, Johnny looked across and, and uh, had a big smile on his face. So that was a thrill and just a champion horse, wasn't he? In between those two horses, you did get your New Zealand Cup with, with Mainland Banner for another owner that supported you strongly, the lady in Dobson. Absolutely. Dobby came on stream just uh, around about the same time as Ross and Angela. 
and he was very supportive, you know, gave me a lot of nice horses to train, but uh, lucky enough, um, Dennis Arai, the Lex Nan of all the Arai clan, grabbed me one day at Methven and said, do you want to buy a good horse? And I nearly didn't stop, but it did, and that was one of the best things I ever did. And of course, it was Mainland Banner, and uh, and I ran up Dobby, and for a start, he wasn't keen on buying, because, you know, young Christian Cullen, and he said, oh, I'll let everybody else make the horse for me, and then... Fame went about two seconds later and he said, change my mind, I'll buy her. And the rest is history. I think 13 or 14 starts and she'd won the cup. Yep. Certainly history has continued for the family. Dex has 10 premierships and, and now Johnny uh, carving out a, a remarkable driving career. And like I said before, so appropriate that he should get that 2000th win for you. Absolutely. Like, I mean, it's d definitely the wins have accelerated since Johnny's come on board. Um, and, and Jenna, of course, as well now. But I think anybody that knows Johnny, he's a workaholic and, and he's an outstanding horseman. And he was always a workaholic from the time he was a little fella, to tell you the truth. And uh, from the time he was five or six, he could, we could come home. Darren, the late Darren to Philip and I come home one day from the trials and I tell quite a few people, I think Johnny was six at the time. We had 30 horses in work and we'd taken six to the trials and when we got home, 24 horses were in their right stalls and they're all fed and six more buckets ready to go. And I was a six-year-old kid, it was pretty impressive and it's never stopped. You trained a handful of winners with Paul Black. You've now trained over 300 with your daughter-in-law. You know, it's a, it's a pretty special operation these days, the Diamond Racing Team. It is, actually. But, you know, right from the get-go, we've had phenomenal staff. You know, I mean, when I started um, way back in the day, you know, I had a, a good crew around me. Johnny Douglas was with me 10 years, Australian that fella, and brothers Brian, like brother Brian and Jeff, and then all the way through, you know, to now, um, I've had fantastic staff and, you know, I, too many to mention, but the people who work for me know they've, and I'm all great, great mates of every one of them. There's not one I couldn't go and have a beer with and have a yarn to and they've been, it's been outstanding that way and that's probably made it a lot easier to get to the number of wins we have, but definitely since Johnny came on board and, and the other thing too, Greg, is the beach. The beach has been a big winner for us, you know, it's, horses do enjoy being there and they definitely can probably race a bit longer and I think a bit better to tell you the truth. You've had the odd injury in your time, and by the time this plays, you're going to have an operation. You're getting a new shoulder. I'm getting a new shoulder, and I can't wait. <laughs> so it's a brand new one. Yeah. yeah, so it's called a reverse shoulder operation. Um, I damaged it in 2003, and that was my last. I'd only had nine drives after I got my hip replaced from my original accident back in 87 or whatever it was, and um, put me out for a year nearly. And then uh, had that replaced, and only had nine drives back, and then I was following Glenis Buchanan when she went down, or Glenis Samuel. When she went down at Rangiora, and I badly damaged the shoulder and my knee, which is now artificial as well. And I put my cue on the rack, as the saying goes. I never have, I haven't had a drive again. I remember coming to the track and I said, All right, that's my last bloody drive. And I, I borrowed the whip off uh, me and Cameron, I think, and I threw it at him. And then I, Jones was there, Pete Jones, and he said, Ah, you'll be back. And I said, I'll tell you what, Skid, I won't be. Yep. And I didn't, yeah, you know, wow, well, his shoulder was knackered. And it, the operator and did the rotor cuff, never worked, Greg, and it's been a real pain for me for years and years so now after my accident a year and a bit ago when the bit broke on a horse here at Pookie and I fell out the cart um, and did my ribs and my elbow and I thought well that's it too. Um, I think I'm just going to put my cue in the rack driving track work too when I come back. Speaking of hospital and hopefully by this stage a great mate of yours, someone you spent a bit of time with in hospital at one stage, Michael Pittman will have achieved uh, the 2000 wins as well. That's a remarkable story. That's an amazing story, isn't it? Because when I came flying over from Greymouth, um, I was sort of semi-conscious and um, they operated on me eventually after 24 hours and when I woke up, Mike was right beside me and he'd had his bad accident, of course, and um, and uh, it's been with him for the rest of his life. But um, amazing, the two of us there, uh, I trained a few winners by then. I don't think he'd even got going. Yep. And now we're both closing. I thought he'd actually get 2,000 before me, but um, just with the weight of numbers lately, I just snuck ahead of him. What's ahead? What lies ahead for you? Once the shoulder thing come, comes right, the passion's still there? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Just going to be like the Chris Waller of racing, I think. Just, yeah. <laughs> so, well, you know, it takes a lot of organising, and uh, book work's huge. Yep. And I do it all, and run, all the, run everything. And if you, this day and age, owners expect and want to you know, know about their horses. So that's a big part has changed from the old days where they never hear from you and you just um, send them an account they pay and then, you know, they see the horse in the in the paper it was in the, the horse was in the field. So those days are gone. Um, Communication is huge for our stable and it's only going to get better, I think. And that will be my go in future because um, I don't, I've got Reese and Penny up here and, and Johnny and Jen down there and I don't need to be giving them orders. They know what they're doing.
So great to get that from uh, Robert Dunn. Michael, can't be overstated how well he's done in his career to get past 2,000 wins and some of the great horses he's had. He's done it too often for it to be a fluke. Yep, uh, horses who stick in your mind. Horses have been a huge part of my career. Um, horses who we love and now they've broken into the trotting ranks and done it just as successfully. Uh, damn good stallion. He's produced John uh, uh, and Dexter, you know, so he's done a super job with uh, embellishing the future of New Zealand harness racing. And now, of course, Jenna's on board as well. A lot of good horse people have worked for him or he's worked for them. He's just a great harness racing story, Greg. And he's, he's overcome his setbacks, as most of us have to in life. But, yeah, he's, uh, he's a true legend of New Zealand racing. And 2,000 wins is a lot, Greg, but 2,000 wins, particularly with those massive peaks of... A master musician and Defoe and of course Mainland Banner and some of the great horses he's had and then of course Sunday Sun. Um, that's a total Hall of Fame career. Yeah, absolutely it is. A big day down at Invercargill on Sunday. It's Diamonds Day. Uh, they've got a Group 1. It is for the two-year-olds, 110,000. Couple of videos to look at. One of them is trained by Robert and uh, Jenna Dunn. Here's Rubera winning the Kindergarten Stakes. Uh, two from two, Michael, and a horse that's pretty smart. Beating Ukraine, who uh, is ex excellent talent as well. It's only had the two starts and always dreaming. I thought this was the signature um, form guide for this, Greg. I mean, you know, these horses are most of the field for what's going to go around on Sunday. So, yep, I, I think Ribera looks the one. It'll be short in the market with the whole um, Purd and Stable thing behind it. But it's a really good early season two-year-old field. And as you mentioned, one of the stars of the, for one of the favourites in the race, um, is the Dunn horse. And, and it took on Ribera two starts, or it took on Ribera yeah, two starts ago for both of them. And Ribera, um, absolutely, on that occasion, was able to beat it. So, pretty good horses. But, yeah, Ribera, at the moment, looks like maybe it's a bit better. But then again, Greg, this race would show progression from that first start to the second start. Yeah, and on this occasion, beat Better's Anvil, who then came out at the weekend and was a winner. Got the chocolates, was the horse that got uh, Robert Dunn win number 2000 in his career. Beautifully bred, son of art major, comes up with a good barrier draw. Rubera's 280, got the chocolates $4.20. Uh, always dreaming you're getting nice odds about it uh, off the second row. Uh, but here is Tim Williams to get his thoughts around their chances. That's Stonewall in the Diamond Creek. Tim, another group one in Southland and it is Anvil. You told me before he started racing you really liked him and he's showing in his two runs today. He's very talented. Yeah, very pleased with the way he sort of stepped up and, and handled the, the trip down and the run on uh, Saturday, Greg. And like I say, he's just a grouse animal and uh, you know very willing to please you. But uh, it's going to be a lot harder this week, obviously, to come up with the business draw. So, uh, you know, I'm sure he'll um, stand himself in, in good stead in, in the field. But, you know, it's a very strong field again this week too. So he'll need to be at the top of his game. Yeah, he will be. It's a it's an excellent contest, and so it should be for that value. We'll hear from Nathan Williamson in the not too distant future about his entire team. But let's go to the Alabar Southern Supremacy. Here's the key lead up race uh, for it. This was last week, Michael, and wow, built for glory, sitting alongside Dreams Are Free, gets past him in double jeopardy. That's it. Last in the Stonewall Colours, storms home. This is the real shock for punters because you could have made a case. I don't know, a month ago that many people thought the favourite here, the, the Nathan Williamson horse, was the best three-year-old in the country, or the most talented. And it's been clearly outpointed there. Winners sat parked outside it. Uh, the next horse has gone super coming from well back in the field, but Greg, it looked like the run of a horse who had been to Auckland, gone all the way back to Invercargill, been given three or four or five days off to recover, and needed that run. So let's hear from Tim Williams about their two-pronged attack. Both three-year-olds race with great credit last week. Yeah, really happy with them both, Greg. Obviously, uh, you know, especially Bill for Glory's first run for a few weeks, so, you know, and beat a cold, you expect to take uh, natural improvement off the run uh, heading into this week. Had to sit outside a pretty smart one and dreams are free, but took care of him quite comfortably and absolutely booming home was double jeopardy. That puts them in great stead for this week. Yeah, definitely, and uh, like you say, once the hood come off, you know, and turned in the other day too, Bill for Glory really knuckled down and... Um, you know, he powered up quite nicely up straight and you know, was lucky enough to hold on from the stable mate who was uh, obviously closing pretty sharply uh, up the straight too. So, yeah, going to be a great race again on Sunday. Is there much between them? 
probably just the trip in transit, Greg. Um, wouldn't have liked to have had uh, Johnny sit on my back the other day the way he took ground off me late, but uh, and that's probably the story of the field on Sunday. It's going to be very tactical and uh, you know very sort of tricky race to who uh, who lobs were in the running, but uh, you know a very even field. Two dollars and seventy cents for Dreams are free. Uh, Harrison John's an interesting runner. Last start, second behind Chaser Dream. He's pretty smart. He's at five dollars six fifty. Double Jeopardy, built for glory, right in the market. Second favourite, two dollars and eighty cents. Uh, Nineteen eighty four. It was first run. The Southland Oaks has got a lot of depth to it too. Let's have a look at Louis Girl in front. Nathan Williamson driving on this occasion uh, has now made it five from nine. Trained by Craig Ferguson. He will be doing the steering because Nathan has two runs runners in uh, the Southern Oaks final. Also there is RDB Mickey. Louis Girl gets home here and gets home pretty nicely, uh, beating First Light, who's a race rival. Louis Girl's $3.30. Ruby Rowe, who finished third, fresh up at Alexandra Park, and then, or first up, sorry, at Alexandra Park, and then seventh in the Oaks. Again, we will hear from Nathan about uh, their chances, but here's Tim Williams on RDB Mickey. Where's Artie B. Mickey at? She's been beaten a couple of times by Queen of Swords now, but they would look to be two perfectly uh, preparation runs, if you like. Yeah, look on face value, probably touch disappointed with her last start. She did have a good blow, so hopefully that's tidied her up for this week. Uh, different race back to the 2700, which I think will suit her, and you know, she's proven herself on, on the tight turning tracks over Christmas down at Roxburgh, so couldn't see her in being a problem to her. But uh, yeah, I think she'll need the right run in transit. She's got the right draw this week, too, so. Hopefully those last two runs have just topped her off. But, uh, yeah, probably leading mightn't be her cup of tea if she got the right run this week. I think she's a, a top three player. Who do you fear? Louis Gill's obviously in great form and, and Nathan's pair are, are, are very, very talented. Yeah, definitely. Like you say, um, Craig Ferguson's one strong one. It's going to be taking, taking shortcuts and obviously the speed it's showing through its career. And, you know, in the group one, sort of late this two year season it was a terrific run that day too so and obviously Nathan's one's come back from Auckland um, you know you can't underestimate them and, and what they've done up all. The one thing the Southland Oaks does Michael was sorts them out particularly over the 2700 metres. Yeah it's going to be a great race really good field I, I love the one horse I think everybody does I mean it's by little Lord Forbes and it's about the same size maybe a touch taller but what concerns me is barrier one I know she led middle stages last time to win and did a really good job but I'm not sure that's the best version of her. I think she's best well, safe. she's so fast. Exactly, safe for one run. And it's 2,700. But if she tries to lead, then Ruby Rowe might be on her back, which is even a bigger issue. So Good race. I, I think it's a good race and a really tricky race. They probably want to hand up on the one, but you've got to be careful who you hand up to. You hand to one of Nathan's horses, the other one might come get the front. It's really tactical, really tricky. The one thing I do know, Greg, is there'll be about 80 metres from first to last yep. because they there's nowhere to hide in these Southlands Oaks summer, uh, Southern Supremacy races. They are brutal races, and they, they always are won by good horses. Yep, they absolutely are. The Country Cups uh, final is as well. Here's Beach Flyby, who has been in terrific form. He's won three of his last five and six from 14. Uh, we're going to get to Tim Williams uh, very shortly. That's him in front, as was the case in the Ashburton Cup. Uh, he was very, very good here, beating Wagstar, and you know what I think of him, Michael, so he's extremely talented, but uh, Beach Flyboy starts from Barrier 1 again. I expect him to uh, step away. If he's in front round uh, Invercargill, he will take a heck of a lot of catching, so let's hear from Beach Flyboy's uh, driver, Tim Williams, on his chances on Sunday. Timmy's a dual Country Cups winner now, Beach Flyboy, and he was excellent last week. Yeah, great man is probably one in the race, um, you know, much the same like it did in the Ashburton Cup. So, uh, been off the front this week, probably uh, assist to him with the manners he is showing at the start. So, especially around in Macargo, it can be, um, can be a great place to be on the markers. So, hopefully, he can bring the manners on Sunday. And, um, you know, I don't think he has to lead to win, Greg, but if he if he jumps and you know, puts himself a wee way in front of the others early, he definitely, um, you know, he's definitely going to be in the front end of the field. It's going to make life a lot easier for me. And a big thank you to Tim Williams taking his time out this morning to give us his insight, as was the case uh, with Nathan Williamson. Here's his overview of Team Williamson on Sunday. Nathan, Diamonds Day, very important day for Southerners and one I know you always look forward to. Yeah, that's right, Greg. No, um, certainly, uh, definitely looking forward to Sunday. Um, yeah, it's a pinnacle day of the year and uh, 
yeah, no, it's uh, hopefully the weather plays its part and uh, no, the fields look great. A race that you wanted to win, I know, for some time was the Alabar Southern Supremacy. You got a couple of those with two really nice horses. Uh, you bring another one to the races this year. Dreams are free. Uh, the Northern Trip, he handled that pretty well. He got the business done on the first night. Didn't have any luck in the derby. Yeah, that's right. He didn't have much luck in the derby. Um, obviously, the draw wasn't ideal, and then he ended up having a tough run. So, um, yeah, look, I think he learned a bit on his trip, though, and I think it'll stand him in good stead for the future. So, um, yeah, no, he seems to have he come back okay. He's certainly um, handled his travel and everything well. So, um, no, we're looking forward to the next few starts with him. What did you make of last week's performance? In many ways, an ideal pipe opener for the big dance this week, I would have thought. Yeah, that's right. It was just probably, um, yeah, more more or less a trial. They didn't break any records and had a good, um, you know, sort of real smart last half and quarter. So, um, yeah, he, he needed that run and he showed, um, you know, he had a good blow and he, he showed he really needed it. So, um, look, we're expecting for, you know, improvement this week. And I think if he improves, um, you know, he'll need to improve. But if he improves, uh, you know, the few lengths we hope he will, I think that'll have him right in the fight. Of course, you've got a two-pronged attack. You've got another really smart one and Miraculous. And I know you've told me before, there isn't actually that much between these two. That's right. No, I think Dreams of Free is probably just a more sort of um, mature horse at the moment. Um, Miraculous has always been a little bit sort of, um, you know, I've had to baby him through a little bit, if you like. But he's certainly very talented. And I think, um, you know, he'll continue to um, keep getting better. Um, he's sort of been set for this race and I've been able to sort of target trying to have him cherry right for next weekend so um he too will take good benefit from his race the other day and i think um you know yeah he, he should improve a few lengths off off the other day so look it'll be interesting i don't think there'll be um a lot over probably four or five of those uh quality three-year-olds on sunday yeah of course harrison john uh, comes to the meeting the two are stonewalls it's a it's, it's a small field but it's a really deep one is, is dreams are free therefore a better chance than miraculous in your in your mind um, I think he probably has the edge just at this stage. He's just probably got more, a wee bit of the all-round game and probably just the the raw class, you know, to to do, you know, um, do the job on Sunday. But, um, yeah, look, it wouldn't surprise me if the runs went the way of the other fella that, um, you know, he wasn't right there too. And, you know, it probably comes down to, um, you know, luck in the running on the day with, um, you know, probably four or five of these runners in this event, you know. All right, you go to the Oaks, again, a two-pronged attack, Flying Alley, uh, already group one place that increased her residual value uh, immensely and Ruby Rowe, uh, very good the first night, didn't have so much like the second night at Auckland, but follows out Louis Girl, which might be a great spot to be. Yeah, that's right. It'll be interesting. It'll be one of those races where the draw will really suit Ruby or it won't. Um, but yeah, we're just sort of in the lap of the gods, what happens in front of us a little bit, but really happy with her. She, um, yeah, she come home and she, yeah, just might have been a wee bit off colour when she raced in the Oaks. She just, uh, I thought she was really good leading into it, but uh, yeah, just was a wee bit off um, when we got her home. So fresh into her and, you know, her work's been great. So um, I think she'll be a hundred percent for Sunday and uh the other girl missed away um, the other day in her first stand, but um, just had a quiet follow around after. And I think she'll, uh, you know, she too will go a good race. So no, both both really good fillies. Will just probably, um, you know, much like the the boys' race, come down to the run on the on the day. All right, you know a bit about Louis' girl. You drove her to win last time. Can you beat her? Um, well, I'm hopeful. Uh, look, I think probably Louis' girl will improve a wee bit again as well. So. Um, it just, as I said, I don't think there's a lot between any of those three fillies or, you know, Chuck Stonewall's filly and there's a couple of local fillies there that go well as well. So, you know, they're good even races and, um, you know, full of quality horses and that's what we want to see. And I think, um, yeah, there'll be some great racing there on Sunday. I'm pretty sure any any of about four or five can win either race. So, um, yeah, just come down to luck on the day. And that's certainly the case. And another group one for Southland. How good uh, the Diamond Creek Classic hundred and ten thousand dollars and it's got a field that reflects that absolutely you know real quality quality field and supported from both the locals and canterbury so uh great to see and yeah no uh diamond creek great sponsors and have really um you know pushed the uh this race you know ahead in leaps and bounds since its uh, inauguration about i suppose it's about 10 years ago now 
Eight's running. There you go, Nathan. Eight's running of it. And you've got Always Dreaming in there who's showed us plenty. Again, what have you made of his lead up run? Uh, look, it was probably um, ideal for him, I think. He had a good blowout. Um, yeah, did a bit of um, work early and it probably uh, took its toll um, as far as the end result the other day. But I do think that'll sharpen him up a lot for this week. Um, yeah, he's he's a very relaxed colt and he's, um, you know, really good at doing colt and he thrives on every run he had so far. So I think that'll really bring him forward. And I think... Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting him over the 2200 as well. Forward into um, Sunday, just to weave it true really well, and I think he'll be, um, you know, nearing his peak on Sunday. All right, they're the feature races. You kick things off with Secret Agent Man. Can the punters get off on the right note? Ah, uh, look, I certainly hope so. He's a lovely maiden. Um, only qualified last week, but um, yeah, he's um, no. He, is a nice maiden and I just thought with um you know being a maiden race on on our feature day um you know he's a pretty smart horse he should be there so look um pretty happy with him and uh yeah he's got a second row draw but that sort of looks like it might work out okay so um yeah no I think a wee bit of him so I'd, I'd like to think he'd be pretty hard to beat all right appreciate your time mate now it's uh, an important week for Southland uh I know how much you love being part of it and um we enjoy being uh having you on the box seat with us as well so I appreciate that no, I appreciate it, Greg. Thank you very much. So you've got the latest from Nathan Williamson. Speaking of the Williamsons, Michael, the retirement this week of Majestic Man. Here was what Phil said to me was his greatest performance. First group one, it was in the middle of COVID. Brad got stuck over there. Uh, what a remarkable horse he's been. The winner of 24 races, 29 times second and over 850,000. Yeah, and he raced at an incredibly tough time to be an open class trotter. I mean, Sunday Sun... Then Muscle Mountain joined him and around of all of that bolt for brilliance. I mean, had those horses not been there, had he been born two years earlier when things weren't quite as tough and open class trotting, he wins over a million and he probably wins an Inter Dominion. He ran second in the Inter Dominion as it was. I think he was unlucky running third or fourth in another one at Alexandra Park. So just a wonderful horse, Greg. Um, owned by a bid syndicate, he would have given them a lot of pleasure over a very long period of time and raced from two and three. Um, on to be a horse who, who changed his racing style. He was a bit racy and then he became a horse who could storm home and then he became a, a gate speed horse. So he had lots of different periods of his career. But yep, had he not been born in the same year as Sunday, or at the same time, Greg, as Sunday's son, I reckon he would have won about a quarter of a million more. Yep, I agree. And congratulations to the Griffin Syndicate. You're right, they absolutely loved him. About to take another break here on your box seat. It is brought to you by our stable of sponsors. A couple of weeks ago, first time winning as a driver. Hayden Douglas got it done with Magic Sign. And Magic Sign's going to be too good. Magic Sign first, super fast. <laughs> In your home straight, in your box seat, Addington Raceway, Thursday night. A couple of races I wanted to have a look at uh, with you. Let's go to the first of those, race eight, Galway Girl. It's a pretty good race, this. Uh, the future well sire stakes. Uh, this is her running second, a very good second, and behind Sonny's sister, be a terrific form race. Starts off the 10 metres. Betton wins come up a $2 favourite for it. 850 Galway Girl. I reckon that's worth speaking. Uh, she's won seven races. She's trained by Stephen McRae. And on this performance, wouldn't need to lift much. Mighty Logan's in there. Uh, Euro style El Conqueror. Uh, but Betton win $2. 450 Mighty Logan. 850 Galway Girl. Along with two Tangata. Uh, I think Galway Girl is uh, worth an each way ticket on. Thursday night. Here's Who's Delights. Low flying at the moment. Uh, in front won two of its last three. Gavin Smith regular pilot for Team Dunn. Helium's in there. Drawn to its inside. It'll go forward for Sam Thornley. I'm sure of that. Tide and Time finishes third here. Came out and won uh, last week. So again 
a very good form line. 280 for Who's Delight. Franco Indy's in there. Devin Dolan, uh, claiming junior driver, allows uh, Franco Indy into this race. Uh, also at $2.80. 6 dollars about Jelendi, who's up in grade, and uh, Helium. But that's a pretty good race. The Breeders' 50th anniversary. So there are a couple from Addington Thursday night. Let's go to Alexandra Park. Two very good uh, races I wanted to hone in on there. Here's the first of them. Uh, Empire City. One at Addington in a fresh condition, Michael. On the plane Monday night, spoke to Phil Williamson. Goes round in race seven. Said, she's very good, but I have told you that before. Massive win. Big, long stride. Strong girl. Um, yep, She's the three-year-old to beat in most of these races heading forward. Tyron Eros goes for a gallop there, so we'll forgive him. But he still has more to learn than she does, and she has gate speed. I don't think we'll see that this week. Um, nice field, these three-year-old trotters, Greg. I, I think already, I know it's very early, I think this is a pretty good crop. I think it's going to be a good crop heading forward. Uh, here's the two-year-olds. Greg, you've been doing some work on these, and two-year-old trotters can be a bit of a trick, but this one's bred to be good. Yeah, it is. Out of uh, Tickle Me Pink, first foal by Father Patrick, comes off the trail there. A lot of these horses are actually going around. Higher power finishes second. Uh, Illicit Love third. Uh, they're all in the same race. The IRT Young Guns two-year-old Trotters Series Heat. But Pretty in Pink's got barrier one, so that's going to be hugely advantageous uh, to it. A.G. Hurlihy. Uh, we'll do the steering there. All right, where can you go harness racing this week? We've just said about Addington, 10 races, 5.03. Ashburton race Friday afternoon. They've got 11, the first of those, 11.53 a.m. Alexandra Park with the 10 races, 5.46. And Invercargill, their big day, 12 o'clock. Michael, that wraps up a pretty busy show. Been a pretty, pretty busy couple of weeks in harness racing and looking forward to the action that we have uh, right around the nation uh, this weekend. Well, the good news is, Greg, it's not finished. I mean, we saw some great horses last week, but the two winners and a lot of the place getters are going to be turning up at Alexandra Park. And Alexandra Park needs some good racing. It's going for a funk, and it needs good racing. And for the next six weeks, it's got it. So my advice to Alexandra Park would be, make it feel special. I mean, I put on some things that make it interesting. Have a band after the last in at least one of the rooms. Do something. Because at the moment, Greg, Alexander Park, which has been my home track for a bloody long time and a place I've spent months of my life, is going through a funk. So let's stop it going through a funk. Let's get off our ass and do some stuff that when my friends and people I like go there in two Fridays' time, they don't go, I don't want to come back. Make them want to come back, Greg. And that's service, that's food, that's entertainment, that's the way you conduct yourselves. If we can't do it for now, Greg, the next eight weeks... You might as well shut the gates and turn it into a golf course. That's Michael Guerin. I'm Greg O'Connor. Both of us will see you in seven days' time. The Box Seat, brought to you by our stable of sponsors. Harness Link, for all your worldwide harness racing coverage. Brecken Farms, New Zealand Bloodstock Standard Bread. IRT, it's your horse and our passion. Garrard's Horse and Hound, Lincoln Farms, Renwick Farms, Harness Racing New Zealand, The Clubs, Auckland, Cambridge, Addington and Ashburton and the TAB.